Again, this is why we are, are extremely conservative with our underwriting, knowing that uh, you know we are most likely going to be hitting very high cash flows, high returns. But we, of course, want to underpromise and overdeliver. So if we say, hey, we're going to hit these, you know, twelve to fifteen percent average cash on cash, we probably in our underwriting we're probably seeing much higher than that. But uh, we want to make sure that uh, you know we we have enough buffer there to to at least hit what are expected, and then of course give out more uh, as we can. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell, and welcome back. And thank you for joining us again today with our guest, uh, Don Spafford. And we're jumping into you know more into RV parks, right? What to expect as a passive investor and as an operator as you're diving into due diligence and, and a number of things that you want to consider before uh, diving into this asset class, uh, either on either side of that, right? Whether you're active or passive. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about some some revenue issues or some property management, some due diligence, some emerging trends, uh, and, and more. Uh, and I know you're gonna learn a lot from Don today uh, as you're thinking about maybe investing or or passively or buying an RV park. Everybody's seen the RVs going up and down the road, right? It's growing. It's a growing asset class. These uh, campgrounds and uh, RV parks and and what is that? I hope you'll you listen to yesterday's show where Don dove into you know the locations and development versus buying pre-existing and marketing we talked about a number of things that uh that you need to know whether you're an active investor or whether you're passive uh, about rv parks and campgrounds uh, and so i want to dive into a few more uh, or a number of things uh, as well uh, so i can have a better understanding of the listeners as well uh, about rv parks before i invest passively or or want to buy one uh, and and we're learning from an expert today don uh, welcome back to the show Thanks for having me back. Glad to be here. Yeah, honored to have you back. I want to. We're we're going to jump right back in, and and because uh, we talked about a number of things yesterday. Again, I encourage listeners to go back and listen to yesterday's episode uh, with Don. Uh, but I, I want to dive into you know when we're uh, maybe some underwriting, uh, some basic underwriting stuff on an RV park, and some of the assumptions that are made. I was thinking about that compared to multifamily. What that you know how, what that looks like when you're underwriting a, at an RV park. Um, could you just elaborate on some of the assumptions that are made, whether it's, uh, you know, the rent growth or or the, uh, you know, the maintenance or I don't know, just walk us through some of those things just so we can get a basic understanding. It's uh, obviously, you know, similar, but but enough different that, uh, you know, it, it takes some time to, to figure out. So the uh, the biggest factors is that, you know, we don't have a standard. We'll say like, you know, you're, you're in, a, in an apartment building, you have your standard rent per month. It's going to be the same, you know, going forward, you know, obviously you're going to have your increases, but. Uh, it's standard across the board. Like every unit rents for you know twelve hundred a month. Easy to calculate that now and, and and know what to expect going down the road. For us, you know, there's there's uh, several different factors. You can, you got your nightly rentals, your your weeklies, uh, seasonals. So all those have different factors. You don't know how many people are going to stay per night every night of the week. And there's a lot of uh, assumptions that have to take in place. But of course, we look at the past you know three or, or five years of data from the existing campground already, and kind of uh, you know use, use that as a starting point. So yeah, they're, they're We'll say you know 50% full uh, year round. Then then that's kind of what we'll use that as an assumption. Uh, in most cases, for, for us when we do our inviting, we are extremely conservative. So we'll maybe even cut that number back even more with the uh, the future. You know, looking for the for the projections. Of course, we still do our um, comps for the area. We'll see what the, the campgrounds nearby are renting for per night, and and uh, kind of see what what amenities they have in sight. So we kind of compare and know what to expect. We'll go from that as a starting point to these to to know where to go. But with our again with with our uh, projections for our underwriting, we are still very conservative on that. So you know, we I'll just give you one example. It's a, a, an example we used uh, last year in our property closed on last year. Is that uh, uh, the existing campsites were renting at thirty dollars a night. The the compro ones in the area were around fifty. So we know there's a pretty big variable there to to get them up. Uh, for our projections, we didn't get up to fifty or even to, you know forty five or forty. We only went up five dollars. We we put our projections at thirty five. Uh, and said, hey, so we we kind of based on like a worst case scenario. So like if this is, you know, only gets slightly better, is it still going to be a great deal? And as long as it hits our numbers, then we know we're going to be golden because we'll, we know we're going to get well above that, you know, $35 a night. But uh, we use that as a very base uh, starting point. Some of the other things, of course, is like uh, we, we tend to overinflate the the salary because, uh, again, knowing that uh, we're going to have to replace the owners that are running it currently uh, with several staff members and probably pay them better, you know, pay a higher uh, general manager, a uh, high salary. So, you know, all those things we factor in and, and kind of uh, just inflate that number considerably. Uh, we put in a, a very large insurance amount. I know for most cases for, for multifamily things, people will try to find the lowest insurance you can get. Uh, you know, for our case, we just want to make sure we have the best coverage we can get. 
All right, so uh, so we overinflate that amount usually, you know, well above what it actually ends up being. But uh, you know, we, we got to take into account. You know, we're not just looking about the building could burn down or whatever. We're looking at uh, people could possibly drown or get injured or killed on site and could sue us, right? So we want to have all that kind of protection. You know, a hurricane can come through or something and wipe out a property. We want to make sure we got that loss of rent in there to to uh, to keep you know keep the the, the investors paid. Um, so all these different factors come in there, and then you've got you know everything else, all those ancillary incomes, uh, the the store sales, the you know boat rentals, uh, you know all these other things that are going on. All those need to be accounted for. And again, for us to be conservative, we cut out about half of those, and, and uh, you know don't even include a lot of those income streams, just to be again extremely conservative. And more or less, a worst case scenario. If these numbers still will work, then this is potentially a great property to, to pursue. If after doing all that and being very conservative, it still is like not great, then you know we're walking away. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's a lot more involved with it, but, uh, you know, you can do the, the simplified version just to, you know, get a quick analysis, but to do the deep analysis, it's, it's usually quite, con, uh, intensive in most cases, sure. you know, especially if you're buying a mom and pop property, they probably don't maintain very good records. Uh, you know, and in some cases, you know, unfortunately they're, they may not be fully honest with what the income actually is. You know, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll say, oh yeah, we, you know, we, we get a million dollars in sales per year, but yet your, their financial statements are maybe half that cause they don't report everything, you know? So uh, you know, you got to kind of, you know, know where to look and, and how to dig and how to figure things out. And, but then of course there's all the things that are on site. You got to do on site visits and be aware of, uh, you know, things that you think are going to be included that they, the day of closing, they may drive away with some things that are on site that you weren't expecting to lose like a tractor or, or something that is there. <laughs> so you got to make sure that everything is written down exactly what, what's going to be included with the sale and, uh, and make sure it's there when you close. So that's just kind of, you know, basic level of, of what, uh, what that involves. Yeah, no, no doubt. I was thinking about how you were talking about, you know, $30 currently versus $50, you know, the competitors and being able to increase that, you know, where with some multifamily, well, there's, you know, with leases being, you know, 12 months, uh, you know, on average, uh, you know, it may take a while, right, before you can, mm. uh, you know, make the proper increases across the entire, mm. entire property, uh, right? But uh, it seems like a, a property like that, though, it's pretty quick. Immediately. Yeah, yeah, it's right away. I mean, most people probably aren't staying there more than a week, right? <laughs> so, yeah, and we, and we don't need to turn over units, right? We place all the flooring and appliances and everything to get those numbers. We can just, yeah, the same day, we can increase the, the prices and, and have it ready to go. Um, and of course, we want to add more amenities on there to, of course, make it a nicer property anyway, make people want to come and pay the higher price, right? But but yeah, there, there's uh, there's no, in most cases, no need that you need to wait to to increase those, those prices for, for, for nightly rentals, yeah. Now speak to some of the... Uh, the due diligence issues that we would need to know about, or just, you know, when evaluating a, an RV park, that's going to be very different than a large multifamily deal, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, aside from the the financials, I was just talking about with the, you know, the, the owner's financials. Some of the other things is just, um, you know, being aware of, of uh, you know, of, of what's, what's nearby. I mean, you got to think about just because it's, it's a campground doesn't mean it's a, a, an ideal location, even if it's on a lake or near a beach or something. There might be something else bad about it that maybe it's next to an oil field or, or something. You know? And so, you know, different factors just to consider for 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 that aspect of it. But uh, you know, for us, the, the, again, it also has to do with uh, what's what's the potential, right? We don't want to just get a turnkey property. Sure, that could be well and it could run fine and, and get great cash flow. But we want to uh, make improvements. We're still looking for value add. We want to have opportunities where we can make it better. Either either includes expansion in most cases, or uh, that, or adding on other amenities. Uh, you know, at a minimum, if it doesn't have a pool, we'll bring in a pool or, or something there to uh, to make it more attractive. But you know, you got to do those those on site visits. You know, there's uh, again a lot of times, just like anything else, uh, you know, what you see in pictures or, or what the 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 owners or, or even in some cases brokers would, would tell you may not be the case. Um, you know, we tend to uncover a lot of things um, as we dig through their financials. One, and then of course, dig, just visit the property and dig through the property and see what's all there. Uh, something that look could look great, maybe for whatever reason, it's it's not. You know, so you got to look at the environmental factors. Uh, potential hazards, the buildings themselves. In most cases, you, know, you don't have a whole ton of buildings, but the ones that are there, you know, if you got to do a complete teardown of everything, then it's probably not going to be worth it either. You know, in, in many cases, uh, again, mom and pop, they may run a, a smooth operation for them to to kind of maintain their lifestyle, but uh, they don't tend to really either have the the extra capital or don't want to spend it to really do much improvements on the property. So a lot of times you'll get them that are somewhat run down. And so, uh, so yeah, you got to make sure that you know what you're looking for. For us, we have like a full due diligence checklist that uh, we go through for everything. You know, as we start off the first process with all the documents we need to get up front, and then when we do a site visit, all things to go through and look at, make sure everything's, uh, you know, good to go. Of course, we still do an inspection after that anyway, of course. But there, there's a quite a lot you gotta just go for. Again, you can't just 
you, know, you don't want to also just just trust the inspector either. You prefer to do that uh, before that ahead of time, and um, and then from there go go from from that. But yeah, we often uh, or we usually say we, we need two inspections. We need one by the inspector that the that the bank or the lender sends, right? And but then we need our own uh, our own you know third party, right? That we've hired. Uh, as well, uh, but or uh, I mean, we're there as well. I mean, inspecting, but I just mean you know we we like having other experts that are not directly connected uh, to the lender or to us or you know. But we're in your case, you're talking about you know yourself, right? You're there uh, and you're in, doing these inspections. I was thinking about the RV spots. You know, I mean the uh, what power, water, sewer, right? Uh, and I, I was just thinking about some of the issues that could happen. You know, with those things, right? Uh, what you know, is that how big of an ordeal is that, or how often do you see issues with those? You know, those things. Uh, you know, in the due diligence that needs to be done there. Well, yeah, some in some cases, the, depending on what those connections are. I mean, most places have, of course, if you have a full hookup, you've got all those things. Um, and many many properties don't have full hookup. You have your electricity and have like a dump site for your for your uh, the waste. Uh, in some cases, it could be a, a large septic tank. So you got to look at um, you know some of those factors. Is like first of all, is that septic take the capacity enough to start with? And if you need to add on more sites, you know, how, how many more septics do you need to add on and what's that going to cost? That's obviously a big expense to, to put in a, a new septic system. So, um, so that, that, you know, that for us was a factor on one of our properties recently that we were looking to do, we wanted to expand it, but then we realized that if we expanded it, even uh, as it was, it was already kind of past capacity for what was there. So we're like, well, automatically right from the start, we need to you know, make it bigger anyway. So there was a, a huge upfront expense that we had to do almost immediately. That was like made it not worth it for us in the end. But for the other ones that are there, the the th- something to think about is um, many of the the older properties in particular have a, a, a thirty amp connection uh, for the RVs to come in and plug into for the electricity. Um, that was the standard previously. Uh, right now, the standard is is more fifty. For us, when we take on a new property, we we want to bump those up to one hundred. Um, and the reason for that is, of course, we see the future coming for the electric vehicles. Um, we, we just had this, uh, it was an interesting discussion this last, uh, November, we were at a, a conference that's a, you know, a big, you know, you know, campground conference that takes place every year. And, um, there was a discussion about, uh, you know, electric vehicles and, and things like that. And many of the campground owners were like, I don't want to, you know, do that and have this place become all, you know, whatever. But we were like, you, whether you like it or not, this is coming, you know, electric trucks are coming, electric RVs are coming. Mm-hmm. If you're not prepared for it, you know, you're going to miss out because people are, are looking for a place to go where they can plug in and charge. If you don't have it, they're going to go to the one down the road that does. And then, and then uh, if also in some cases for for a lot of the mom and pops, uh, they themselves pay that electric cost. You know? So they'll they'll say that maybe the, the seasonals pay their own, but everybody else, the nightlies, they'll they'll you know they don't charge that to the 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 guests because they don't really have a way to do that. You know, when we take them over, of course, we put in uh, meters that can charge them for the, the the minute they plug in, the minute they unplug, that uh, they get charged for what they use. And that may not seem like much for a standard camper now, but you know, one night of an electric vehicle plugging in and, and charging, they're going to suck up more electricity than the whole month of a uh, standard user, right? So you got to make sure that that gets charged back to them. Uh, so that's one of the things that we implement when we uh, are taking over properties. We are putting those meters in and uh, and increasing those uh, those meters to handle those larger capacity charging stations. That way, one, we're prepared for it when it comes. And then uh, that day when, when it happens, we're not also scrambling to try to, you know, make this big expense to, uh, to fill those and get them all uh, upgraded. So uh, so that's something to, to take into consideration. What what chart? What type of uh, of uh, electrical meters pedestals are there now, and what you need to do to be prepared for what's in the future? That's a good thought, especially if you were developing a park, right? Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, that's a good thought because to upgrade a hundred spots, uh, you know, or I guess re-meter every spot. I'm, I would imagine that could be quite expensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Do you have a you know, like an an average cost number as far as what it costs to develop an RV? I know that could be all over the place with you doing a a pool and amenities and all this stuff. I don't know. I just wondered if there's like some kind of ballpark, um, you know, maybe a bare bones if there's no pool and I don't know. Of course, the prices have been going up. You know, with everything else, you know, the materials and labor and things goes up, and uh, and there's gonna be some variance depending on location uh, exactly, and and of course how nice we probably want to make it, but. Uh, typically, you know, now you know, we are looking at at least for, for estimating, we're, we're going to say it's going to cost you around probably forty thousand per site to uh, to build out something new per, per you know per RV pad. Um, that's kind of just a standard you know number to, to to build it out to know what to expect if you're putting in you know hundred sites or thousand sites or whatever um, to include all. It's, it's not just the the pad itself. You got all the infrastructure, the the roads and everything goes in between, and uh, yeah. and all those amenities and whatnot. So uh, that's kind of about a standard you know figure more or less. 
Yeah. Uh, what about uh, any emerging trends or opportunities that you see in this asset class uh, that you know, we should be uh, aware of? Um, well, one of the, like we mentioned, of course, the the, uh, the you know the electric vehicles that are starting to come through, and I see more and more uh, you know articles that you know fully electric RVs are being produced now. But the biggest trends I've seen in the last few years is, is that uh, the majority of the the new campers, right, the the larger number of new RV buyers and large number of new camping households are younger generation, uh, you know, Gen Z, Gen X, these these people that are now possibly most of them working remotely. You know, they are taking life on the road and working from their camper or working from their RV. Uh, and so that's been a, a big part of what the amenities that are on site need to have. You know, so a lot of the, you know, like, you know, the older campgrounds, like, you know, like my grandparents would have went to, you know, years ago, they were kind of more like uh, you were talking about before, people don't want to get away from it all, they used to be out in the middle of nowhere and, and now have nothing going on. Unfortunately, that's not the case these days. Most people that uh, are traveling, they're they're you know young, young couples or young families have kids. They want to have things there on site. They want to have amenities to keep the kids entertained and uh, have good Wi-Fi connections to. They can work remotely, um, you know, do their podcasts or you know whatever they do. And so, uh, so you know, you need to uh, account for that and and know what your, your audience needs. I mean, there, of course, there's probably still some campers out there that want just the nothing basic stuff, and those they'll you know have their space. But the growing trend is. These younger generations that are coming up, and they're going to be overpowering, overtaking those, those older generations as they, you know, you know, as they, as they die off. But as they go away, the uh, you know, you're, you're going to need to uh, have the needs that what your users want. And if you don't have those amenities on site, then you know, you're going to slowly go out of business and and uh, you know, not be able to keep up and, and not be able to make the revenue you're you're hoping for. Um, so you got to be aware of all that and, and you know, know what people are looking for and what they want. What about uh, preparing for a downturn? You know, when looking at an RV park or things you're you do ahead of time to, I don't know, you know, like we talk about reserve budgets or, you know, things like that to know that, hey, something happens and then something else happens that was unexpected, <laughs> you know, right. when it happens, we're, you know, we're prepared. Yeah. Well, sure. So, I mean, what's what's great about this space for us and the properties we target, uh, we, we buy pretty much everything off market direct to the, the you know, we go direct to the campground owners and we call our, 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 do our cold calling. Uh, and so by, buying off market like that, we tend to buy it at great prices. We're usually around like a 10 cap is what we're buying at. Um, and so it gives us a, a large amount of buffer there for the, the cash flows. And of course, with those higher cash flows we get, uh, yes, we do uh, set aside reserves to to hold for one for our investors, make sure they get paid even during those slower seasons of you know winter months and whatnot. So 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 there's definitely enough reserves for those kind of things. But, uh, you know, kind of to, to more to your question, I guess, for like a, we'll say like a worst case scenario, right? If it just say, you know, for whatever reason, people stop camping, which is, of course, not likely to happen. But let's just say, you know, World War III or something where people are just, you know, afraid and stay in their homes, not going anywhere, do nothing. These properties can easily be converted into like a full-on RV park or, or a, you know, a tiny home community where you can just drop in a bunch of cabins or tiny homes and and turn it into a long-term stay, uh, you know, community, uh, you know, pretty easy. All those connections are right there. You just, you know, put them in and plug them in and, and you're ready to go. So uh, that's kind of like a, a, a very easy plan B if we have to go that route. Um, to make it still so it's profitable and and at least can maintain it, nothing else. But uh, aside from that, yeah, we, you know, we we of course have reserves and and uh, uh, several other plans in place for things that go on. But again, this is why we are, are extremely conservative with our underwriting, knowing that uh, you know we are most likely going to be hitting very high cash flows, high returns. But we, you know, of course, give our our our, our uh, investors, you know, uh, you know, we of course want to under promise and over deliver. So if we say, hey, we're going to hit these, you know, twelve to fifteen percent average cash on cash, we probably in our underwriting, we're probably seeing much higher than that. But uh, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we we have enough buffer there to to at least hit what are expected. And then, of course, give out more uh, as we can. What's your uh, best source for meeting new investors right now? Um, for me personally, it's been actively posting and commenting on, on LinkedIn. Uh, that's where most of my uh, personal investors are coming from. And of course, going on podcasts like, like yours to just get the, the word out there, get the audience out there and let people be aware of what's going on and, and what's available. Um, and I go to a lot of, uh, you know, meetups, uh, uh, over, over, uh, you know, virtual meetups that I get to talk to people and, uh, you know, just let people know what else is out there. Uh, that's for me has been the, the biggest factor is just, uh, that networking component and, uh, being active and, uh, you know, just, uh, constantly educating people of, of, of this space and what they can expect. So people that are, that are looking and, can, and see it will like, wow, I want to learn more. And, you know, and then they come and, and, uh, get more educated. Then, you know, from there, they can make that decision if it works for, for their needs. What's the biggest challenge you all are facing in your business right now? Probably at least for 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 the uh, the syndication aspect of it for investors, there's a lot of fear out there right now. Obviously, as we're, most of us are aware of what's happening with many of these multifamily properties have gone been foreclosed on or 
uh, are not uh, delivering the the expected returns because the the uh, interest rates are higher and they can't refinance as they planned. All these different things are going on, so that is affecting obviously that space a lot, and therefore makes people kind of uh, hesitant to invest in anything at, at the moment, which you know, unfortunately affects us and, and other you know yeah. good syndicators and sponsors out there too. So, uh, so right now we're trying to help investors kind of get past that those fears and understand that again this is not that space. We do things very differently. Um, and, uh, there's, as of right now, no need to be concerned of, of those same types of issues that they're facing. Cause we are not in that same boat. <laughs> we are totally different space, totally different, uh, financing, uh, you know, going on and, um, you know, so, so that's kind of the, the biggest thing right now, just kind of overcome those challenges of, of, uh, people fearful because of everything else that's happening. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Is there any, any tips or ways that you are combating that or, or communicating or with your investors or what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. So of course, you know, we send out uh, you know emails uh, to you know, to our to our venture base, letting them know that uh, you know like those uh, those those bank closures, uh, you know, no need to worry about that for, for us and the banks we use, and then um, you know everything else that's going on. We we address those in in our webinars. <clears throat> we tend to do uh, you know usually about monthly webinars, just in, in general. We hold quarterly Q and A webinars with our investors, um, just to kind of go over over any questions they may have about anything, and um, so we we try to address those uh, you know. Up front and and let people know, of course, and we send out our monthly newsletters for each of our properties as well. Let people know how they're how they're going, good and bad. You know, if something unexpected comes up, hey, well, we had this unexpected problem happen, uh, but uh, you know, your your distributions are are still going to be fine, so no no concerns, um, that kind of stuff. So we we keep on updated on what's going on, um, and then uh, personally, what I've been trying to focus on, knowing that you know, there's the the standard uh, you know retail investors, you know, people like like you and me that are out there that. Uh, maybe are fearful to invest. We know that there's those larger institutional b- businesses or groups that are out there that you know aren't afraid. They know they still need to put their money to work. So uh, I've been trying to more reach out to those groups and find those you know family offices, private equity, um, you know other larger you know high net worth investors that have money to invest and want to invest it. They they still understand that you you got to have your money working or you're gonna you know lose value from from the uh, you know for anything else going on. So so I'm trying to kind of target more of those. I, of course, I still talk to the the standard retail investors as well. I'm not going to say no. Nope, I don't have time for you. I'm st- I talk to everybody, <laughs> but but I'm trying to do more specific outreach to those uh, those larger institutions to uh, to bring their capital to our deals, and uh, and uh, I've been able to to secure a few of those as well. So um, that's kind of what uh, has been my my focus to to get around that issue at least for now, uh, and which also could help set us up for for the future as we continue to grow too. Yeah. Uh, what are some habits that you are disciplined about that have helped uh, you know or produced the highest return for you? I'd say probably still just the the, the networking component. Um, that's for, for me. It, it's it's uh, definitely as a, as a time consumption. You know, I gotta you know be present and go to these uh, networking events. I don't go to as many as I used to, but uh, you know, before I really got involved in this space in particular, I was going to networking events like literally every day of the week, just about, and uh, sometimes multiple times, like two or three in, in a single day. And so um, the the biggest thing for me was 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 that just to get out there and get to meet people, uh, have them get to know me. Prior and again, prior to when I had anything, I was building up that network of people that would know, like, and trust me. So when I did have deals come up, then uh, I could go back to, them, hey, by the way, now I'm doing this. Uh, you know, you might be interested because you know we've talked about. I know what you're looking for. Um, this this would meet your needs, and and, and so so that for me has been the the biggest changing factor that uh, has has uh, been the most benefit to me in my life, which was again. Uh, uh, Kind of a difficult thing to do because I was very much an introvert. So uh, the very first networking event I went to, I I, I like literally backed out. I, I I logged in, saw people there. I'm like, nope, I, I left. You know. So, uh, but as I got past those fears and kind of pushed out of that that shell, you know, that uh, and started opening up more, uh, that's been the, the a huge help to to me and my business, and you know, what helped lead me to where I am today. How do you like to give back? You know, many ways. I mean, I, I it's people that know me, uh, I'm always willing to to help. Um, you know, wherever I can anyway. So uh, I, I help give advice to uh, to new investors looking just to what to do, uh, whether it be a house hack or look at review uh, some other duplex or something. You know, I, I'm, I freely give my time. I don't ask, you know, for, for pay for my time to, to talk to me. Uh, you know, you know, I don't feel you're wasting my time, but uh, you know, I, I do a lot of that just to help. And of course I do, you know, educate through my, my uh, posts and things, but my wife and I, we love uh, helping our community, uh, trying to do things that where we can volunteer our time, uh, and our money. Uh, my wife is from South America, so we, we like to try to do more to help you know her community as well, uh, you know her family and friends and, and people there. Uh, again, myself having lived in Argentina too is it's um, one of our, our goals as we you know can, can, are able to do more. 
we like to give more. For, for me, giving is a, is a big component of, of everything. You, know, you can't you can't be happy with success if you're not giving back. That that's for me is a, a major factor. Is make sure you, you you give more than you receive, honestly, because uh, that's what brings the most satisfaction. And just accumulating money and things doesn't really make you happy. Being able to help others is what does it. Don, I'm grateful to have had you on and 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 do a series, right? I want to remind the listeners as well to go back and listen to to yesterday's episode with Don, uh, where you're going to learn more about his background, but also more about some specific things about RV campgrounds and why investing in them. Uh, you know, things we need to know, right? If you're going to invest in them passively or actively, uh, and then I mean, diving into some of the assumptions and different things that uh, you want to know is also whether you're passive or active. Uh, uh, when you're underwriting a, a deal or talk, maybe talking to an operator considering to invest uh, that I, that I, I feel better about, or I feel like I've learned a lot uh, over you know this time with you, Don. And, uh, and so I'm grateful. And I know the listeners are as well. Uh, but how can they get in touch with you and learn more about you? No, thanks. Um, as I mentioned, of course, I'm, I'm active on uh, social media. LinkedIn is kind of my preferred spot. Uh, also on Facebook. Um, actually, of course, on bigger pockets too, but um, you can find me uh, on those sites or you can also go to our website, beyondercamp.com, uh, go to the uh, holdings tab and the about us tab of that to uh, find me and, and to set up a time to call um, or just feel free to email me at don at beyondercamp.com. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.